protons, neutrons, and electrons, those three subatomic particles, the function of Okay. So protons and neutrons, they're in the nucleus. We spent more time talking about them because we talked about isotopes, we talked about it figuring out atomic mass and everything. We like mentioned electrons, but we were just like, they're electrons and they're outside of the nucleus. And we kind of like moved on. So this is really we're backing up to why are electrons important? Protons and neutrons give the atom mass. And that is really their big job. The nucleus is the mass dense part of the atom. Electrons. Electrons, remember, they're negatively charged. They're like 2,000 times smaller than a proton or a neutron. They're very small. I like to think of them almost like little, little particles of energy, okay? But they're in constant motion. They're in constant motion and they follow a specific path. So think of it like an orbital. So an orbital, like how the moon orbits the earth, right? So the earth and so the moon's doing this, going around, and it's got a very specific path. It doesn't just randomly fling itself about. It stays on this sort of trajectory that's very predictable. Same thing with electrons. They're in constant motion in these orbitals. So what they found when doing the research is they found that electrons that are closer to the nucleus, they have a shorter path. Since they have a shorter path, they have they can move slower, they have lower energy. But the ones that are further and further out, they have to make the same loop in the same period of time that the ones closer in make. So like if you think of this distance and compare it to the distance of the outer electron, so you agree that the outer electron has a longer distance, well, they have to make their loop in the same period of time. So that outer one has to actually move faster. So they say that the, the electrons closest to the nucleus have the lowest energy. The further you get, the bigger their path, the higher their energy level. So like anything else, we would like to use the lowest amount of energy to do anything, right? You know, like waste energy, you know, like why am I going to start this now? I can wait and start it a little later, right? Same thing. With an atom, electrons want to get into the lowest possible energy level. And so they're not just randomly found. They start at the closest to the nucleus. The bigger the atom is, the more electrons it has. The more electrons it has, the more energy levels you find electrons in. So that first energy level, though, has the lowest energy, but it's so small, only two electrons fit. So that first energy level, I said there's two electrons maximum that fit into that first energy level. So if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen is the smallest of all of the atoms, all the elements. Hydrogen, you see that it has an atomic number of one. That means there's one proton and one electron. It's one electron fits in the first energy level. So it's really up close to the nucleus. Helium, going straight across because atomic number increases as you go across. Helium has two protons and two electrons. But those two electrons, they fill that first energy level. That first energy level, when it is full, it creates a stable atom. So this is why helium, even though it only has two electrons, it's in the column with what they call the noble gases. The noble gases are neon, argon, krypton. So all the ones down that far right, those are sort of your stable elements. These are elements that rarely form compounds. Some of the big ones do, but the little ones, they don't. That's like if you have neon gas, like what they put into neon lights, and they, when you run an electric current through it, it glows. So that was kind of a cool thing that they discovered to be able to make neon lights. But neon exists as individual neon atoms. It does not form a compound because it has this very stable electron configuration. So helium, having just two, makes it stable. As you go up, so we have hydrogen and helium. When we look at lithium, and this one's really lithium, see there's three electrons. Two electrons can fit in the first energy level, okay? And it's the lowest amount of energy. 
The second energy level is where that third one would have to go. So it doesn't have two electrons. So two electrons are in the first level. And then that one electron has to be in the second. And that second level has, it's a little further out from the nucleus. So that means those electrons are moving a little bit faster, a little bit higher in terms of their energy. Then as we continue across this row, as we add, you'll see that you'll increase the number of electrons in that second energy level. You'll have two with beryllium, three with boron, four with carbon, five with nitrogen, six with oxygen, seven with fluorine. We're just going straight across. But then we get all the way over to neon. When we get to neon, now we have eight. And eight is the maximum number that fits in the second energy level. So again, in the periodic table, when we get over to that side, now we get a full second energy level, and that is going to create a stable gas, or a stable noble gas, which is neon. So neon has two electrons in the first energy level, but it has eight in the second, creating that stable electron configuration. And they actually found that for all elements other than hydrogen and helium, eight is this stability. So eight creates this balance. Eight creates an atom that's not trying to interact and react with other things. It's always the electron number. And it's not just their total electron number, because do you see with helium, for ex or yeah, with um, neon, for example, so neon, it has 10 electrons. There's two electrons in the first energy level, but it's the outer energy level that is full and creates that stability. So there's a chart that shows all of them. So this one actually is the whole 20, okay? I did kind of shrink it down a little bit. So one to all the way through 20 shows you the symbol. And notice this comes into play, this group number. So hydrogen, which is in group number one. Notice that it has one electron in its outer energy level. But now let's go down to the next one. So look at lithium. What does lithium have as its outer energy electron? One as well. So that outer electron number matches its group number. So when you think of group number, group number, and this really works only for the first two columns and the last six columns. At the very top of the column, do you see a number in front of a capital A? That's the group number. So the first column is group 1A, second column is group 2A. So that number actually tells you how many electrons are in the outermost energy level. All the energy levels inside or underneath are all stable. It's just that outer energy level that we're actually looking at. So now you tell me, looking at sodium, it's in that same column, how many electrons in its outer energy level? You would expect it to have one as well. Going down to the next one, so looking at potassium, it also has one as well. So everything in the first column will have one electron in its outer energy level. It's got energy levels underneath, but all of those are full. It's that outer one that's not eight. The outer one is the one that wants to try and interact either by gaining, losing, transferring electrons in order to create stability. If it doesn't have eight, it's not stable. So everything in group one, not stable. Everything in group two then, if you look at beryllium, see how this one's two? Then slide down, magnesium directly underneath it has two, calcium, directly underneath it has two. So everything in group 2A has two electrons in its outer energy level, and those two electrons are the ones that we're gonna be using in order to do bonding. So you don't even have to memorize this. You just have to remember to look at the number in front of the capital A. The number in front of the capital A is going to tell you how many electrons in the outermost shell. So if we slide all the way over to group 3A, the top one is boron, so you know now that it has three. It's in group 3A, and so now you also know aluminum has three as well. See how those ones match? The group number is going to tell you the number of valence electrons. So as you go across, like carbon and, and silicon both have four. Oxygen and sulfur. 
Oxygen, yeah, oxygen and sulfur both have six. Nitrogen and phosphorus both have five. So now we can just identify it without actually having to like think, okay, well, it's got 10 electrons. How many in the first? How many in the second? I don't care about the electrons in the underneath levels. I really only care about the outside one because if the outside energy level does not have eight, then this is going to be reactive. This atom is going to try and form a chemical bond to try and create the stable eight. So that's sort of the rule. So remember, this is those main group elements. So it's the first two columns and the last six. So those ones in the middle, see they have B at the top of their column. So the third column going all the way over to zinc's column, like the 12th column, those ones are actually a little bit different. You can't go by their group numbers, but you can for the first two columns and the last six. The number at the top in front of the capital A tells you how many electrons in the outer shell. Those electrons in the outer shell, they call them valence electrons. Okay, so they might refer to this as the valence number or the number of valence electrons. And so Dr. Lewis, who is somebody that studied atoms and studied these electrons and their behaviors and how they form molecules, he said, well, an easy way to try and indicate the number of electrons in the outermost shell is by using the dots. So for something like hydrogen, you would just have one dot, okay? One dot on any side of that hydrogen atom would indicate its number of valence electrons because it's in group one. And it would be fine if you put your dot to the right. It would be completely fine if you put your dot above. I don't care where you put it as long as there's one dot on one side and no more than that, just one. So same thing with sodium. Because sodium's in group one, I would just use one dot. But now, what would I do if I had beryllium? How many dots would I need? Two, because it's this number. Okay, so this tells me beryllium would have two dots. And you could put the two dots side by side, or you could put the two dots on opposite sides, or one up and one to the right. I don't care, as long as there's two dots. Okay, so beryllium has two electrons in its outer energy level, and each dot represents one of them. Going across then, carbon. How many dots? Four, because it's in group 4A. Now, I will tell you with these, once you get beyond two, I want you to split your dots out because it is going to make it easier in doing bonding. So like with carbon, put one dot on each side. So put them like this. Spread them out. Don't put like two and two. It wouldn't technically be wrong, but it's difficult to see bonding if you don't have them spread out. So you always want to put like your dots, spread the dots out. Now when you get to nitrogen, it has how many? It has five. So if it has five, then that means one of them is going to end up being paired. Okay? Oxygen would have six. And so that means that two of the sides will have a pair of electrons and then two sides will have singles. But notice they're still spread out. You're never going to put more than two dots on any side when you're doing a Lewis dot structure for an element. Fluorine, almost there. It has seven dots. So one, and it doesn't matter which one, one side has a single dot. The other sides will have two each to give the total of seven. So just remember, the number in front of the capital A tells you how many dots. It tells you the number of valence electrons. And then you get all the way over to neon, which is super happy because it has eight. So the goal is to have this. When you have this, that's stable, okay? And I told you, except for the weird oddball. The oddball is hydrogen and helium. Helium, only two electrons fit in the first energy level. That is why helium, even though it doesn't have eight, it's over in group eight, because the first energy level is full with helium, so it's stable like a noble gas. Okay, so when you go buy a helium balloon, helium exists as single helium atoms. Helium does not form any compounds. It doesn't do bonding. It just exists as a single little stable atom. You just have a clump, clump of them or a collection of them. Okay, so argon, how many would argon have? Eight. Eight. 
So all of them except for helium on that eighth row or eighth column, sorry, the eighth column, they all have eight. So if I had to do calcium, how many would I put? Two. Sodium would have? One, okay? So you're not looking at the number of total electrons. I'm only looking at the group number because all I'm interested in is how many electrons in the outer energy level. Because if it doesn't have eight, then it's going to be able to form a compound. Okay? So remember then the group number, that capital A, and it's really these two columns and these six columns that I'm talking about. Okay? Those ones that have a capital A above them, those are the ones that's all you got to do is look at the periodic table and you know how many dots. That's why everybody should have a periodic table. If for some reason you came in, you don't have one, please come up and get one instead of straining your neck to be able to look at the periodic table. Okay? So we did this. So this is what they found. They found this. They said, okay, atoms that have a stable number of outer electrons are not reactive. They typically have eight. So neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, all the ones except for helium, all the ones down that eighth column, they found are very stable, don't form compounds very easily, don't interact with other molecules, they follow the octet rule. So whenever you think of the word octet, you might think of an octagon or an octopus because they all refer to the number eight, okay? So just remember eight is the goal. So if you have an atom like sodium with its one little valence electron, that doesn't have eight. So that means that this sodium atom wants to interact with other atoms in order to achieve some stability. So the way they do this is by bonding. Chemical bonds are formed to try and create a stable number of eight for the atoms that make up the compound. So one that's really common is NaCl. So most everybody knows that NaCl is sodium chloride. It's table salt, right? So it's on most of you, the foods that you eat. So how does it form this stable compound that sits in your salt shaker and doesn't like burn through the table <laughs> that doesn't like, it's not super reactive. It can exist for years and years and years in your little salt shaker without causing any kind of damage. I will tell you that sodium metal, sodium metal, if it is just the atom, the pure element sodium, you have to store this under kerosene. So it actually is like a little clump of metal. It has to be stored underneath kerosene, which is like an oil, because sodium reacts with the air. If you take a piece of sodium metal and you throw it in water, it will react so violently with the water, the water will boil. So like I've seen like videos, people like taking sodium metal and throwing it in a pond and it like literally like skips all over the pond and like you're like, you get all of this smoke and bubbling and everything. That's how reactive it is. So a single element like, that it, like sodium that exists as a single atom, that one electron makes it very reactive. But sodium chloride, is table salt, like you ingest it all the time, don't have any problems. So that is because of the first type of bonding, which is called ionic bonding. So in ionic bonding, let's talk about sodium first. What happens with sodium, the sodium atom, remember that if you look at the periodic table, you have 11 protons and 11 electrons. And it's that one little electron in the outer shell that causes all of the trouble. Right? So that one. So sodium actually tries to get rid of it. And that's why it reacts with the air. That's why it reacts with water so violently, because it's literally trying to get rid of its electron. Because if it gets rid of its electron, now it will only have 10 electrons. And looking at the periodic table, what element has 10 electrons? Which one? Mm -hmm. Do you see that this is the number of electrons that neon has? Neon's a noble gas. So if sodium can just lose its one electron, then it's going to have an electron configuration just like a noble gas. And that's why sodium that loses its electron becomes stable. 
But now it doesn't have an equal number of protons and electrons. So elements have equal numbers. If these are just elements, atoms, they have equal numbers of protons and electrons. But when you have unequal numbers of protons and electrons, now you have what is called an ion. So sodium becomes an ion. It's a positively charged ion that they call a cation because it's got one more proton. If you do a comparison now, it's got 11 protons and only 10 electrons. So it ends up with a positive charge. So this is why when you see sodium written, they were talk about sodium levels. They don't just say Na, you always see it written with an Na plus. So that is indicating a sodium ion versus a sodium atom. And sodium ions have a noble gas stable configuration. This is what allows sodium chloride to be so stable. So the other part of the coin is chlorine. So chlorine, kind of like the opposite of sodium, chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons. So remember if you had the dots, you would have seven dots around the chlorine. It's only missing one. So kind of like the sodium wants to get rid of its one electron, chlorine is like wants to pull an electron from anything, okay? So it's very reactive as a single atom because of that one missing electron. So chlorine will pull any available electrons. It only needs one. So it will actually bring in an electron add its electron to its atom. Now it's got 18. So again, looking at the periodic table, what element has 18 electrons? It's like argon. And you know argon is a noble gas. So by gaining one, that fills its outer shell with eight and that creates stability. Now chlorine, if it gains a negative electron, now it's got 18 electrons and only 17 protons. This is why you see chlorine written with a Cl minus. That indicates the charge on the chlorine. It indicates that it has one more negative electron where sodium has one more positive proton. So this is also an ion. Atoms with the charge. Charged atoms are called ions. And these ones, negatively charged atoms, they call them anions. So there's like cations and anions, positive versus negative. So the easiest way to have this happen is actually by putting these two together. So if you take sodium and you take chlorine atoms and they come close together, the sodium literally wants to give its electron up and the chlorine is more than happy to pull it in. So there's one that's trying to release its extra electron, that one electron that stops it from being stable. The chlorine pulls that electron and it becomes part of the chlorine atom. So it doesn't hang out with the sodium ever again. Like it actually now belongs to the chlorine. There is no sharing. There's no like half and half type of thing. There is this true transfer. And that is why you end up with sodium ions Na is now always going to be positively charged because it lost its negative electron. And the chlorine is always going to be negatively charged because it has gained that negative electron. But now what do you know about opposites? Opposites attract, and that's what an ionic bond is. So the attraction of the positive ions to the negative ions creates what they call an ionic bond they would refer to NaCl as an ionic compound. So a couple of things about ionic compounds or ionic bonds. So in ionic bonds, it is always a metal and a nonmetal because metals have very few valence electrons, like one or two, maybe three if we're talking about aluminum. But all the first two columns are metals the ones we're really going to use, so talking about like sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and aluminum, those are kind of like the big ones. And then the nonmetals all have five, six, seven electrons. They have almost a full shell. And so that makes this big discrepancy between them allows for an easy transfer of electrons. The electrons are always transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. So they're one, always, metal and nonmetal. 
there is always a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. That is going to always form ions. The metal is always going to end up having some kind of positive charge based on how many electrons it loses. The nonmetal is always going to end up with some amount of negative charge depending on how many electrons it gains. So if it loses one electron, it's a plus one charge. But if it loses two electrons, that'd be a plus two charge. Losing three electrons will be a plus three charge because those electrons are negatively charged. On the opposite coin, the nonmetals, if they gain one electron, like chlorine, that would give it a negative charge because it's got one extra negative electron. But if it gains two electrons, then that would give it a negative two charge. Gaining three electrons would give it a negative three charge. So the metals will always end up with some kind of positive charge. The nonmetals will always end up with some kind of negative charge. So here's like the steps. If you're trying to figure out what an ionic compound is, you, when you're given two elements, one, check the periodic table. How do you know what's a metal and what's a nonmetal? What do you just look for? The zigzag line, right? Everybody remember the zigzag line is the one that de de denotes it. Everything to the left of the zigzag line is a metal. Everything to the right is a nonmetal. So if you're given two atoms and they're on opposite sides of the zigzag line, it's an ionic compound, okay? If they're all nonmetals, then it's covalent. But if they're on opposite sides of the zigzag line, then you know you have an ionic compound. You always list the metal first. So I think of like NaCl, sodium is listed first. The metal is always written first. You have to assign the charge that these will have. Metals are always going to lose their electrons, and their charge will be their group number. So sodium is in group one. So we said sodium would end up with a plus one charge. So also then, potassium would end up with what? A plus one charge, because it's in group one. Okay? So the group number tells you the charge. So then magnesium, what would its charge be? A plus two, because magnesium is in group two. And you can put plus two or two plus, I don't care, okay? You'll see them both. All it means is it's either a plus two or a two plus charge, okay? So writing it either direction, it's always written as a little sub superscript. What about calcium? It's going to be a plus two as well, okay? You see it's in group two. The only other one that you'll really see a lot is what about aluminum? Aluminum is a metal. It'll end up being a plus three. Do you see that aluminum's in a in group three A? So everybody understands how you figure out the charge. It's just the group number. It's just going to lose the valence electrons. The group number tells you the number of valence electrons. The group number also tells you what the charge would be for the metal. Now nonmetals are going to gain. So nonmetals, the easiest way to figure out what their charge is is to take eight, which is the stable octet and then subtract their group number. So that tells you like how many electrons they would gain. So like with chlorine, chlorine's in group seven, eight minus seven is one. That's how I know that chlorine has a negative charge. So what would nitrogen be? It'd be a, nonmetals are always gonna be negative. So eight minus the group number would be negative three. So everybody see that, C group 5A, above nitrogen, that tells you there's five valence electrons. I have to gain three electrons to make eight. So eight minus five tells me that I would have a negative three charge. What about oxygen? Mm -hmm. Negative two. Okay, so the group number eight minus the group number will tell you the negative charge for the nonmetal. If the charges are equal, like with sodium chloride, right? So sodium's a plus one, chlorine's a ne negative one. If they're equal, then I know that all I have is like one sodium and one chlorine to make my formula. So it would just be NaCl. One chlorine combines with one sodium combines with one chlorine. 
But what if they're not? So look at the next one. So if I have magnesium and chlorine, magnesium's a plus two, it's in group two. Chlorine's a minus one. But notice that they're not the same. The charges, if the charges are not the same, then I need to swap the charges to determine the formula. So what do I mean by that? That means that the number for the charge on the magnesium tells me how many chlorine. The number for the charge on the chlorine tells me how many magnesium. So this two tells me how many chlorines. This, if it, you just see a negative, remember it's just a one, right? If they don't have a number after, you know it's just a one. That negative one tells me that I would have one magnesium. That's how I get the formula, okay? So you list the metal first, then the non-metal. Assign their charges. If they're not the same, then you have to swap the charges in order to figure out the formula. Sometimes when you do this, notice with this one, we have to be able to simplify. So to simplify, see how calcium's a plus two, oxygen's a minus two? Does everybody understand where I got the plus two? Hand if you don't. Okay, does everybody understand how oxygen's a minus two? Hand up if you're not sure. Okay, so if I do this swap, this two on the calcium tells me I have two oxygens. This two on the oxygen tells me I have two calcium. So when I write my formula, it looks like this. But see how I can simplify this? So since they're both two, I can kind of simplify, divide both of them by two. So the simplest whole number ratio is what you always want. I can't simplify MgCl2 anymore, but I can simplify CaO, Ca2O2 just to CaO because they want it in the simplest whole number ratio. So since we're doing this, we might as well do the naming. So the naming with ionic compounds is you always use the whole name of the metal, the first part of the non-metal plus IDE. And so NaCl, what do you call it? Sodium chloride, everybody knows that one, right? So sodium, I use the whole name of the metal. First part of the metal, so instead of chlorine, it's chlor, okay? So chlorine is chlor, so what would fluorine be? Fluoride. fluoride. What would bromine be? Bromide. Bromide, first part of its name, plus I-D-E. Iodine would be? Iodide. What about oxygen? Oxide, sulfur. Sulfide, I'm just going through all the nonmetals. This is how the nonmetals, you use the first part of their name plus that IDE. What would nitrogen? Nitride, mm -hmm. so just nitre and then IDE. Phosphorus? Phosphide, okay? Those are pretty much the nonmetals you've got to work with. Those are the ones that are in groups five, six, and seven, and they're only the ones in that upper corner. So there's only like six, seven, well, there's eight of them total because all of those halogens that cause trouble, <laughs> okay? So that's all you do is you just take the first part of the nonmetal plus IDE. So NaCl becomes sodium chloride. MgCl2, whole name of the metal, magnesium. First part of the nonmetal chlor plus IDE, magnesium chloride. And then CaO would be calcium oxide. Don't have to use any numbers. You just have to like give the names specifically, okay? Here's another way of looking at it. And sometimes like I find students have like this whole swapping thing, like it seems like a block, okay? So in this one, I like the oxygen and the aluminum example because they're very different. Aluminum in group 3A has a plus three charge. Oxygen over in group six, eight minus six, tells me it's a negative two charge. So do you see that they're not the same? So if the charges are not the same, I have to swap them. So this tells me the three, for the aluminum, tells me how many oxygen. The two on the oxygen tells me how many aluminum. I don't swap the charge, so I don't put like plus three or minus two. I just swap the number. And some people are like, well, why? I don't understand why, <laughs> okay? So if I look at Al2O3, Al2O3, okay? So this tells me how many aluminum? Two, two aluminum. So every aluminum has what charge? Plus three. plus three, see in there, remember it's in group 3A. So I know that this is plus three times two, which would be a plus what? 
plus six plus plus three times two, a positive three times two is a positive six. And then what about the oxygen? What's the charge on the oxygen? A negative two. And how many? Three of them, which gives me a charge of negative six. So do you see that the positive, total positive and negative charges are equal? Ionic compounds chemically are neutral. They do have positive and negative ions, but they exist in a ratio so that they balance each other. That's why you have to do the swapping. So you have to do this swapping to figure out the correct ratio of metal and non-metal. That's just to explain why you end up doing it. That's all you really got to do, though, is you just assign the charges and swap them. The charge on the metal tells you how many non-metals. The charge on the non-metal tells you how many metals. If you can't simplify, then it's the way it is. Okay, so let's practice a couple before. I thought I had it. Ugh, sorry. So in this, what if we had, you tell me, what if I combined calcium and nitrogen? If I combine calcium and nitrogen, tell me what would the formula be and then what would the name be? Calcium and nitrogen. What if I combine cal potassium and oxygen? What would its name and formula be? Nit not nitrate, this nitride. Hmm. So in each case, calcium, what's its charge? Plus two. Mm -hmm. Make sure you put the plus, okay? So calcium's a plus two, it's in group two. Nitrogen, what's its charge? Negative three. And it's because it's in group five, eight minus five tells you it's a negative three. Swap them, what's the formula? Mm -hmm. So the number, the plus two, the two on calcium tells me how many nitrogen. The three in nitrogen tells me how many calcium. Can I simplify that? No. See it three and two? So that's it. And its name? Mm -hmm. Calcium nitride. Whole name of the metal, calcium. First part of the nitrogen, nitre, and then IDE, so nitride. Okay, potassium, K. What's this charge? Plus one. Mm -hmm. So it's a plus one. Oxygen, what's its charge? Minus two. Okay, so now they're not the same. So when I swap them, how many potassiums do I end up with? Two, right? The two on the oxygen tells me how many potassium, how many oxygens? Just one. Mm -hmm. So it's K2O. Name? Mm -hmm. So remember, you, this is where going back and I said, you've got to learn the symbols and the names of these elements. Like this is again, so if there was a couple there, you're like, oh, I didn't know those ones, okay? Reviewing them, practicing them, remembering that K is potassium and not phosphorus or the other way around, okay? So practicing those ones, if you missed any of those, those would definitely be ones to go back and look at. This is like, it's pretty basic, it's pretty simple. Do the exact same thing every single time. So we do have to talk about the oddballs. There's two oddballs. Two oddballs in ionic bonding. <laughs> One of them is transition metals. So this brings in this group. The group in the middle, okay? Always causing troubles. The group in the middle, they're metals, right? Because they are to the left of the zigzag line. But they have pretty big numbers of electrons, right? So they're all in the 20s and 30s and then going into the 40s and 70s. They got a lot of electrons. They, when you get a lot of electrons, then those outer energy levels do some of this weird overlapping that we're not gonna talk about any more than to say that. But that means that these, some of these metals can lose different numbers of electrons and still be stable. We're only gonna talk about three of them. Okay, the only three that you're responsible for knowing is iron, chromium, and copper. 
So iron, chromium, and copper, find them on the periodic table. Iron is 26, chromium is 24, copper is 29. Okay, they're the top in that top row of those transition metals. So iron, Fe, it can actually lose two electrons, but it can even lose three electrons to create a stable compound. So it can exist as an Fe plus two or an Fe plus three. So do you see that means there's two different ways that iron can combine with chlorine. So when they found this, they were like, hmm, <laughs> okay? Because they got like used to like sodium chloride, potassium oxide, like these ones that like there's this only one way. These ones are odd because there's more than one possible combination of a metal and a nonmetal with iron, chromium, and copper. Chromium can also, like iron, can exist as a plus two or a plus three. So see the middle one. So you can have Cr plus two or Cr plus three forming compounds. Copper can only exist as a plus one or a plus two. So I can have copper combining with oxygen and forming two possible copper oxides. So I can't just call this iron chloride because how would I know which one it is? I can't just call the bottom one copper oxide because I wouldn't know which one it is. So what I have to do is I have to use a Roman numeral to represent the charge on the metal. So this one, so Fe, Cl2. So to figure, you've got to figure out what is the charge on the iron. So you kind of do like this, like kind of like a reverse swap. So what's the charge on the chlorine? What do I know the charge on chlorine is? Negative, because it's in group seven, right? So I know that it only gains one electron to make eight. So I know that my chlorine is going to be negative. So if I have two negatives, what would the charge on the iron have to be to balance that? It's going to have to be a plus two. So remember that the compound itself is neutral. If I have two chlorines, each chlorine is negative, then that means that my iron has to be plus two to balance the negative two. But do you notice the other thing? If you did like a reverse swap, so notice that the number on the chlorine tells you the charge on the iron. The number on the iron tells you the charge on the chlorine, right? So if you look at those two subscripts, do you see that you could like do the opposite, like a reverse swap as a way of figuring out what that charge is. So this two can tell me the charge on the metal. So you can work it out as the math, like the number, total number of positives versus negatives, or you could just take those subscripts and swap them, and for 99% of the time, that would be able, you would be able to figure it out. So the number on the non-metal can tell you the charge for that metal. So what would FeCl3, what's the charge on the iron? Mm -hmm, it's a plus three. So that chlorine is still a negative, right? Because it's over in group seven, that doesn't change. But notice that means that I'd have to have a plus three as the charge for the iron. So to tell the difference between these two, they are both iron chloride. But because the first one has a plus two, I put a Roman numeral two, just two I's, in between the iron and the chlorine in the name. So iron two chloride tells me that the iron is a plus two charge. Whereas this one would be called what? Iron three chloride. So if I told you that I have copper one bromide, how would you figure out what its formula would be? So what's copper? Cu, and that Roman numeral one tells me its charge is a plus one, right? So this tells me the charge. So the Roman numeral one tells me the charge in the copper. What about bromine?
Right, so it's in group seven. Eight minus seven tells me it's a minus one. So what would its formula be? Yep, just CuBr. Because see how it's a one-to-one, -one, just like how sodium chloride is? Copper has a, min a plus one charge. Bromine has a minus one charge. They're the same, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So it would just be CuBr. What if I had chromium three sulfide? What would you put down? So what's chromium? CR, so you assign, you write down what the symbol is. So what's the charge on the chromium? Plus three, mm -hmm. because this Roman numeral tells me it's a plus three. The Roman numeral tells me the charge on the metal. So then what's sulfide? It's an S, and what's its charge? Negative two. Group six, eight minus six is two. That tells me it's a negative two. Now, when I swap this one, it's not one to one. So how many chromiums? Mm -hmm. So I'd have Cr2. How many sulfurs? Three. So you can go back and forth. If you're given the name, you can find the formula. If you're given the formula, you can find the name. And I do have, hold on. Where are you? Yeah. So here's one. This is like slide 37. Apologies. I don't know why I didn't put it in earlier. I should have moved it up because I find it's easier just to do the whole thing together. There's a couple we're going to skip because we haven't, and it's probably why. So we're going to skip this one and skip this one. But you can do this one. K3N. Just tell me its name. Mm -hmm. Potassium, good. Nitride. Very straightforward. So if you're given, if you see that it's a metal and a non-metal, then you just say the whole name of the metal, first part of the non-metal, plus IDE. What about this one? Nope. What is CA? CA is calcium. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I want you to work backwards. Tell me the formula for this one. So first you gotta figure out what are the symbols? Fe and Cl. What is the charge on the Fe? Plus three. What's the charge on the chlorine? Negative one. So when I do the swap, what's my formula? Yep. Mm -hmm. So since the chlorine's a minus one, only one Fe, chlorine, because the iron is a plus three, I end up with three chlorines. So I just assign, so you put the symbols, assign the charges, and then swap them. What's this one? Sodium bromide? Na? Br, what's their charges? Plus one and minus one. So it's a one-to-one. -one. So the way that it's written, that's its formula. So if the po positive and negative charges equal each other, then you know it's like a one-to-one -one ratio. So it would just be NaBr. I don't have to do any swapping because they're equal. Tell me the name of the next one. Cu3N. Okay. What else do I have to add? Nope, it's not telling me the number of copper. What's the Roman numeral going to tell me? The charge. So you got to figure out what is the charge on the copper. How did you know? Because there's only one nitrogen, so I know this is a plus one. 
right? That's like the reverse swap. So nitrogen I know is a minus three. It's over in group five. Eight minus five tells me it's a negative three. See how those match? The number of copper and the charge on the nitrogen is the same. So that means that the nitrogen number is gonna tell me what the copper charge would be. So I've gotta put a Roman numeral one. So it'd be copper one nitride. Okay, so I'll rearrange, we'll have well, another practice with this because I want, I want you to be able to go, you should be able to go from formula to name, name to formula, back and forth with them. For homework over this weekend, there is an ionic compounds dynamic study module that has you do this, has you assign charges, has you do the swapping. So make sure that you do that because that's gonna help kind of like fill it in, help it be like, okay, I'm a little more comfortable. That's really the goal with mastering. Mastering is to help you get more and more familiar, more and more comfortable with practicing this. Because I always say it like, this is a lot like math. You've got to practice it because it's not just something you sit at the dinner table and talk about, okay? So when it's not something like that, then you really got to have like exposure to it and be able to practice it and feel like you're like accomplishing something so that you feel more comfortable with it. So there's only one more, sorry, I gotta go all the way back. There's only one more oddball. So the one oddball, copper, iron, chromium, and those are the only three I will ask you. So that's probably something you wanna put on that note card, right? What it means, what that Roman numeral means, maybe an example or two of what you have to have. So the only other oddball in ionic compounds is that there are what they call polyatomic ions. So poly means multiple or many. Polyatomic ions are just a group of atoms that collectively have a charge. Most of them that we're going to talk about, they are negative charged ions. There's a couple, there's really just one that we're going to talk about that's positive. And the easiest thing to do is just to go through them. So the only ones that I'm gonna ask you about are the ones that are in the boxes, okay? There's lots of them. If you look, like here's the second page. There's a lot of them, okay? Most of them are where you have a non-metal and a lot of oxygens. So notice like with nitrogen, I can have NO2, I can have NO3. With, with carbon, I can have CO3, HCO3. But notice most of these have a lot of oxygens combined with them, but as a group, they exist, they have their own name, and they have their own formula with their own charge. So the first one is this one. So OH minus, OH minus, this is called the hydroxide ion. I'll write it bigger just to make sure everybody can see. So anytime I have an OH written like that with a metal, it's gonna be a hydroxide. So if I have NaOH, I use the whole name of the metal, sodium, first part, or, and then I just use the name of the polyatomic. So this one would be called sodium hydroxide. So recognizing that that OH at the end of, a, of an ionic molecule is a hydroxide is important because I have a lot of students who look at this and be like, oxygen hydride. Okay, oxohydra. Like, try to come up with a name. What you want to remember is OH is not just oxygen and hydrogen separately. OH exists like as its own little group, and it's a hydroxide. Next one. This is the only positively charged one. This is NH4 and has a positive charge. So this is the only one that you'll find out front. So if I have NH4... I. I just use the name of the polyatomic, which is ammonium, first part of the nonmetal plus IDE, so that would be what? Ammonium iodide. So when you have a polyatomic, you say the name of the polyatomic, think of it being like its own little group doesn't split up, it stays all together. NO3, the third one. This is the nitrate ion. 
Nitrates are common preservatives. Most people have them eat hot dogs that have preservatives like this or ham, cold cuts, lunch and meat, that kind of stuff. Large amounts have been linked to cancer. Tell your child that when all they'll eat is hot dogs. We went through that stage, <laughs> okay? But that's the NO3, NO3, and it has a negative charge. So if it's got a negative charge, it's always at the end of the molecule. It's always like a non-metal, so it's always gonna be second. The only one that ever comes out front is that ammonium, the NH4, because it's got a plus charge. So it like takes the place of where a metal would normally sit. So going down, so in this one, NO3, if I have Mg, NO3, 2. Where have you seen that? Where have you seen the parentheses? When did we talk about parentheses and what you have to do? Balancing equations. Do you remember parentheses? Like you had to count the number parentheses tells you everything inside's found by that number. If you go back and look at your balancing equations, all of those ones in parentheses, they're all polyatomic ions. So they're all those NO3s, SO4s, PO4s. If you go back and just look at them, you're like, oh, they always list them together. They don't split the nitrogens and the oxygens up. They list it as NO3. And if there's more than one NO3, you have parentheses and a number outside. So what would I call this? Whole name of the metal? Magnesium. First part of the non, or not that, magnesium. I keep trying to say that. It automatically comes out of my head. Okay. So NO3 is the nitrate. So this is magnesium nitrate. So I don't have to worry about naming the nitrogen and oxygen separately. I just call it the nitrate. So magnesium nitrate. Going down again, getting the chlorine group. This is the chlorate. Chlorine has chlorate, chlorite, hypochlorite, which is like bleach. These are typical disinfectants. Remember how chlorine is a really good disinfectant, how all those halogens are used like iodine as cleansers. So the chlorate ion is found that way as well. And it is ClO3 with the minus one. So ClO3 minus. So if I have this, because the chlorate has a minus one charge, aluminum has a plus three, I would have to have this ratio, I would call this what? Aluminum chlorate, mm -hmm. just the whole name of the polyatomic. So that's three, I got seven. So there's five on this and only two on the next page, okay? The next one is the carbon one. This is the carbonate. CO3 with a minus two. Minus two, two minus, I don't care how you write it. I'm really bad about writing it the other way compared to the book. Minus two, two minus, either one is completely fine. It's just a negative two charge. So in this one, if I have Na, which is a plus one, I would have to have two of those in order to balance my carbonate. So the carbonate would be a minus two. I'd have to have two sodiums. So Na2CO3, what would its name be? Sodium, whole name of the metal, and then just the name of the polyatomic, carbonate. So these ones are going to be big ones in recognizing. Recognizing when you see that CO3, don't try to split it up. Think about it as like one unit. Okay, so there's these. That's the OH minus. One, two, three, four, five. Here's the only other two. The sulfur containing one and the phosphorus containing one. Okay. So the sulfur containing one is SO4 with the two minus. Magnesium sulfate is in Epsom salts. So in this one, like if I have this Mg SO4, what would I call it? Mm -hmm. Magnesium sulfate. And then PO4, which has the highest charge, it's a negative three. It's the only one with the negative three. So it's a PO4 with the negative three, or three minus, either one. So see, I flipped my charge number thing. There still means the same thing. It's got a negative three charge. So phosphates, where have you talked about phosphates? 
in biology. Phosphates are part of a really important molecule found in the nucleus of the cell. It forms the double-stranded helix. Mm -hmm. So in nucleic acids, remember you have sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. Those make up the chains. And then you have those bases that link them together. So the phosphate is a PO4. So every other group along those chains is the phosphate. Also, people think about ATP, which is energy. It's the universal energy molecule of the cell. That's adenosine triphosphate. So that actually has three of these groups linked together. So we will talk about them again. But if I had, hmm, I'd have to have this. Phosphate is a negative three. Potassium is a plus one. So we're doing that swap. I'd have to have three potassiums to make one phosphate. And the name of this would be? Mm -hmm. Just using the name of that polyatomic. So now you tell me the formula. And then you got to look that one up. What's hydroxide? OH with a negative. Mm -hmm. So remember, when you, you want to like write when you're starting to like, like make this list, don't just write the formula of it. Make sure you put that charge because you're going to need to know the charge if you're going to figure out a formula. So what do you notice about these? They are, they're equal. So what does that mean? That they're just a one-to-one -one ratio. So this would just be listed together, all one. So what about this one? What if I have, I'll give you a second. Let's just see if you can do it. I'm gonna put this one, I'm gonna put two other up here. And then we'll quit, because it's about time. All right, so potassium carbonate, potassium symbol is K. And what's its charge? Plus one. Remember, it's in group one. And then you got to look up carbonate. Carbonate is CO3, and its charge is a minus two. So what are you going to do? Swap them, okay? So how many potassium? Two. And then how many carbonates? Just one. Right, so remember the three at the end doesn't mean three carbonates, it's just three oxygen. So that's one carbon and three oxygen makes the carbonate. I don't have to have a parenthesis. If, like, if the charge of K was, um, was two, what would mm -hmm. have to I'd have to put parentheses in the two outside. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's try this one, which we'll have to do next. You have to do that one. Okay, so then that leads us right into this next question. <laughs> so calcium phosphate, calcium is a what? Ca with a plus two, and phosphate is a PO4 with a negative three. Now in this one, they don't match. So how many calciums in the formula, how many calciums would I have? Doing the swap, the number, the charge on the phosphate tells me how many calciums. So this would be Ca3, and then how many phosphates? Two. So when I do this, I have to put the entire phosphate formula, parentheses, and then a two outside. Because that's saying I have two of those. Because remember, think of them like one big thing. 
I can't split the, phos the phosphorus up from the oxygens. They always stay together. All right, one last one. So if I have magnesium chlorate, magnesium's a what? Mm -hmm. And then chlorate is what? What's its formula? ClO3. Everybody see that on the previous page? The chloride is ClO3 with a, with a negative charge, so they're not the same. One's a plus two, the other's a minus one, so I have to swap them. So how many magnesiums? Just one, because the charge on the chlorate's a negative one, so magnesium is just one of them. But now how many chlorates? Two, because see the plus two on the magnesium means I gotta have two chlorates. So I have to put chlorate, ClO3, put parentheses in the two outside, okay? So I don't have to put parentheses around other elements, but if you have polyatomics, then I've gotta have the parentheses in order to be able to show that, okay? So this really finishes ionic bonding. These are really like the main things we want to talk about, basic writing, naming, polyatomic transition. So do make sure that you get that dynamic study module for ionic done. Next Tuesday, we will talk about covalent. Okay, we'll talk about the second kind of bonding.